my name is Marissa La Rochelle, and I am uveitis faculty at the Moran Eye Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, University of Utah. And today we're going to be doing a lecture which I've titled Anterior and Intermediate Uveitis, a Practical Approach for the Comprehensive Eye Provider. This is a lecture I've given to several groups of optometrists and um, comprehensive ophthalmologists. Um, and I thought I'd record it so we can share it on the Moran Core. All right, so over the next hour, we'll go through a quick review of definitions, and then this is going to be a case-based lecture. So we're going to go through six cases, and then I'll highlight some important points of each case. The learning objectives are as follows. And to start, this is the SUN, which stands for Standardization of Uveitis Nomenclature Working Group Classification. So this is how we talk about uveitis. And this working group, um, it's a bunch of people that sit around and they talk about how we should distinguish uveitis, um, which is very helpful. So uveitis is named on the primary site of inflammation, the anatomical location of where that inflammation is. So as you can see from this chart, Anterior uveitis is when the predominant site of inflammation is in the anterior chamber. That's the space between the iris and the cornea. And this includes entities like iritis, iridocyclitis, whereas intermediate uveitis is when most of the inflammation is in the vitreous chamber, um, including pars planitis when intermediate uveitis is idiopathic. And then posterior uveitis requires an inflammatory lesion in the retina or the choroid. Things like multifocal choroiditis, birdshot would fit into this category. And then panuveitis is when you have all of the above. So you see inflammation in the anterior segment in the vitreous, as well as posterior involvement, meaning an inflammatory lesion in the retina or choroid. Importantly, just macular edema or optic nerve edema does not count as posterior involvement. Those can just be secondary to um, anterior intermediate uveitis. So for grading inflammation, um, this is, this is very useful because um, it, it lends some consistency between observers, between clinicians, and that's important for following patients in clinic as well as for research purposes. So when we talk about anterior chamber inflammation, we're actually counting the number of cells that we can see in a one by one millimeter beam of light at the slit lamp. Um, and if there's about 10 cells in that area, that's one plus, about 20 cells is two plus, um, 30 cells is three plus. Once we're at the 20, 30, 40 range, we're not counting individual cells, but um, we're still using that as a, as a grade. And then for um, the, um, the way we grade flare is the, the haziness of the details of the iris and the lens, as you can see here. All right, now for grading vitreous inflammation, rather than counting cells, vitreous haze is based on how easy it is to make out the features in the posterior segment. So we can see a score zero, there's um, well-defined margins of the disc, we can easily see the vessels. Um, and when we get to two and three plus, we're losing some of the definition of the optic nerve and four plus vitreous cell, we can no longer see the optic disc. Okay, on to our first case. This is a 70 year old man with unilateral eye pain and redness. It happened all of a sudden, so it's acute. He's also experiencing light sensitivity. Otherwise healthy visual acuity and effective eye, affected eyes decreased at 2060. And we can see some asymmetry of his intraocular pressures with the affected eye being higher. This is an anterior segment photo and it's notable for some scleral or conjunctival injection, some corneal haze and it looks like there's some pigment on the endothelium. It's hard to grade anterior chamber cell um, with this photo, but we can clearly see that the eye is red and there's corneal involvement. His slit lamp exam is notable for injection. He has both small and medium KP or keratic precipitates, um, as well as pigment on the endothelium with desme membrane folds, that's DMF and corneal edema. Anterior chamber has inflammation, two plus cell and flare. And we also notice some transillumination defects in the left eye of his iris. So differential diagnosis for this patient would be idiopathic, meaning iritis can happen. We're not sure the cause of it. Herpetic is definitely suspicious with that high pressure on the left side. Um, HLA B27 definitely presents as an acute unilateral anterior uveitis. And then always think about post-surgical. So that'd be infectious endophthalmitis, patient had cataract surgery a week ago, um, and then traumatic. So I'd ask about 
Does this patient have prior cold sores, any recent surgeries? And then you step back from the slit lamp and you look at the entire patient and you notice he has a zoster rash in the V1 distribution. So I think that's a slam dunk diagnosis for um, herpes zoster associated anterior uveitis. I would call this a keratouveitis uveitis since there's inflammation both of the cornea and the anterior chamber. Um, classic findings of herpetic uveitis, high intraocular pressure. So usually the intraocular pressure in patients with iritis is low due to ciliary body shutdown um, from inflammation. But in herpetic disease, due to a trabeculitis, the IOP is paradoxically high higher than normal. Corneal involvement, so we all know a dendrite or a pseudodendrite tips us off easily to herpetic disease, but really any corneal involvement. It can be um, stromal edema, desmae membrane folds, focal endothelial disturbances or opacities. Um, decreased corneal sensation, if you remember, uh, maybe on the next visit to check the corneal sensation before your technician puts in the propericane. Recurrent iritis only in one eye. Um, so B27 disease is on the differential, but it typically will alternate eyes over the course of years. If you have a patient that's always in the same eye, consider herpes. Sorry, I skipped over iris atrophy. So the classic teaching is that HSV causes patchy iris atrophy and that VZV causes sectoral atrophy, but this isn't always the case. So any transillumination defects, um, think of herpetic disease. And then the KPs, keratic precipitates, they really can vary in size, shape, location. They can be mutton fat, greasy, they can be small and fine, um, distributed anywhere on the cornea. So for a laboratory workup in this patient, if he comes in with that classic vesicular rash and V1 distribution, um, I probably wouldn't do any other workup for uveitis since that's a pretty clear diagnosis. The caveat being, if it's a young patient, a 25 year old, and he comes in with that zoster rash, I would probably check a HIV since um, normally young immunocompetent patients don't get zoster. Um, you must dilate this patient. So although it would be atypical for an immunocompetent patient to start with shingles and iritis and then progress to um, posterior involvement with the retina or acute retinal necrosis, um, you must check. So definitely dilate the, the patient at the first visit. And then on subsequent exams, it's okay to just follow the anterior chamber flare with non-dilated exams, unless the vision drops and um, the vision doesn't seem in proportion to what your, your anterior segment exam findings are, then dilate again. Okay, management for herpes zoster. Valtrex is val acyclovir, one gram three times a day for seven to 10 days. Acyclovir is less expensive and the dose is five times daily. Um, instead of just abruptly stopping the antivirals, if they're on long-term um, topical prednisolone, sometimes I just reduce the dose of the antivirals to a prophylactic dose, such as 500 or one gram of Valtrex daily for as long as they're on the topical steroids. Um, I would use topical steroids based on the degree of anterior chamber inflammation and corneal edema. However, if there's epithelial involvement, such as a dendrite or pseudodendrite, sometimes I hold off on the topical steroids for a couple days, make sure that the epithelium's healing with the antivirals, um, and then a couple days later, add the topical steroids. You can also consider using gans or topical. Okay, so this is a clinical referral from Dr. Vitali, Dr. Foster's book that states, it is widely believed that uveitis associated with involvement of any corneal layer is a manifestation of herpetic disease until proven otherwise. Some patients need what I call long-term low-dose antivirals and possible topical steroids. So if they continually recur with herpetic disease, I may have them on one drop a day of prednisolone acetate or 500 milligrams um, Valtrex daily to just suppress their inflammation. Importantly, if you're managing patients for cataract surgery and or any other kind of retinal surgery, I tend to increase the um, the oral antivirals around the time of operation because we know surgery can be um, can reactivate herpetic disease. So I'd go back up to treatment dose on the oral antivirals, um, maybe starting a week before surgery and then continue it for a couple weeks after surgery. Dilate every patient with uveitis. All right, our second case. 
We have a 25 year old woman. She comes in with redness, pain, light sensitivity. This is three days after being hit in the eye with a soccer ball. Past medical history for systemic lupus. She wears contact lenses, vision slightly affected in that right eye, pressures are normal. And you do notice that the right pupil isn't reacting properly. Her anterior segment exam is notable in the right eye for mild anterior chamber inflammation, a few keratic precipitates. So what's her differential diagnosis? She said she was hit with a soccer ball about three days ago. Uh, this could be um, definitely traumatic iritis would be top of the differential. Other things to think about, are those actually red blood cells or pigment? Is this a traumatic microhythema? Um, of course, look for other signs of trauma, corneal abrasions, iris involvement, um, less likely an occult open globe or retained foreign body with that good vision. Um, and then think of unrelated inflammatory iritis. And it's possible that that injury was just a red herring. I'm sure we've all had patients um, that relate something like getting dust in their eye to something that couldn't possibly be related, like bilateral age-related cataracts. But it's just that uh, that event brought attention to to their, their eyes or their vision. So for workup in this patient with a history of soccer ball injury to the eye three days prior, I would probably just do a thorough exam. I would dilate the patient, make sure we're not missing anything in the posterior segment, such as um, commotio or a choroidal rupture. And then doing gonioscopy on subsequent exams um, in case there's any damage to the angle. So classic findings for traumatic iritis, it's due to blunt trauma, typically um, two to seven days after the injury. Vision is good unless there's other damage to the eye. And then we treat with cycloplegia and topical steroids. And I'd follow within a week. And clinical purse for this one is looking for any other ocular damage. The timing, so if they said um, they were hit in the eye a month ago and only developed symptoms yesterday, probably not from the trauma. Okay, so I put lupus as part of her past medical history, sort of as another red herring. Patients with systemic lupus really don't get isolated anterior uveitis as part of their systemic lupus disease. So um, I think a lot of people think, oh, lupus, they must have iritis or iritis, let's check for lupus. And in reality, patients with, with lupus just don't get isolated iritis. They can get posterior findings, um, they can get scleritis, they can get vasculitis, but just anterior uveitis would be uh, very uncommon. Dilate every patient with uveitis. Okay, this is our next case. So in this picture, we can see an anterior segment photo of the left eye. And um, we see this layering of presumably white blood cells so much that it's creating a white line at the bottom of the anterior chamber known as a hypopion. And let's take, take a moment to think about a differential diagnosis for this finding. Uh, this is how we prepare. I prepare the residents for oral boards is you just describe a photo and then name something in the photo like a hypopian and then state a differential diagnosis for that finding. So with no other history, if we don't know the patient's age or past medical history, what would be a broad differential for a hypopian? Okay, HLA-B27 anterior uveitis. We encounter this commonly in our clinic. What else? Bichette's disease. In some parts of the world, Bichette's is the most common cause of a hypopian must remember infectious causes of a hypopian. So infectious endophthalmitis, whether it be post-surgical, such as after cataract surgery, or endogenous can happen um, in patients with history of IV drug use or sepsis. Um, infectious hypopians can occur in association with a corneal ulcer. Drug-related, um, the classic ones that you're tested on is rifibutin. Um, that is a medication that is used to treat or used for prophylaxis in the treatment of Mycobacterium avium complex or MAC in HIV positive patients. A pseudohypopian. So we said that that layering was of white blood cells. Maybe they're not actually white blood cells, but they could be um, malignant cells. They could be ghost cells and causing ghost cell glaucoma or lens induced glaucoma or steroids. Maybe someone was trying to do a um, subtenons kenalog injection and accidentally injected inside the eye and then the steroids can precipitate out and look like a hypopian. So take a good history. 
this is a 30 year old man. So he's young. He said, Oh, I had something very similar happen to me. It was the other eye and it happened two years ago. He said no recent surgery or trauma, but he does endorse low back pain worse in the mornings. And when you take a careful family history, it reveals that he had an uncle that walked with a cane and was kind of hunched over at an early age. Yeah. He had a non-contributory social history. So now this is very suspicious for HLA B27 related disease. Vision is affected 2100 in the left eye. You can't see to the back of the eye, so you do an ultrasound, um, but the ultrasound is normal with no vitritis. So what's the workup for uveitis? Um, in general, you can see the workup listed is ruling out things like sarcoid, TB, syphilis. In a patient that comes in with just unilateral, acute, non-granulomous anterior uveitis, I would just check an HLA-B27 and an FTA RPR. If this patient was positive for HLA-B27. So I use those words, acute unilateral alternating recurrent anterior uveitis. And those are sort of buzzwords to, um, to let us know the course, um, the typical course of this disease, which is very classic for B27 disease. Um, don't forget that not all HLA B27 disease is ankylosing spondylitis. We also have to remember psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, um, and the GI illnesses like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, and they can be associated with uveitis as well. About 25% of all men with any type of anterior uveitis end up having ankylosing spondylitis. And then if we only include patients with unilateral acute anterior uveitis, um, it'll be B27 related in over 50% of the time, as high as 81% of the time. Okay, management for that HLA B27 associated anterior uveitis, topical steroids and cycloplegia. So topical steroids, how much is enough? I use this one to four rule, which I kind of just made up. This is a rough guideline. It's not in the literature, but the one to four rule is one plus AC cells. So that would be about 10 to 15 cells per high power field equals four drops of prednisolone acetate, 1%. Um, so then double it. If you have two plus AC cell, that would mean eight times a day prednisolone. Once we're up to three and four plus AC cell, then we're talking about hourly um, prednisolone acetate. Um, and this applies for prednisolone acetate 1%, um, diflupredinolone or durazole is stronger, so it's about twice as potent, so you could use this rule, but then um, divide by two accordingly if you're using durazole. It tends to be more expensive, but it can help with the dosing schedule if you're using it frequently, it can help with compliance. Um, I do think durazole elevates the pressure more frequently, especially in children, so that's something to watch out for. With patients with severe anterior segment inflammation that you know is not infectious, you can consider a short course of oral steroids um, or a sub ounce catalog. And then prevention. I have a question mark near oral NSAIDs. So there's pretty good evidence that um, long-term oral NSAIDs such as naproxen taken regularly can prevent the recurrence or suppress the inflammation and decrease the episodes of anterior uveitis and B27 disease. But um, I tend not to use chronic oral NSAIDs to prevent episodes of uveitis since there's um, some concerning side effects that have come out more recently in addition to the known GI upset and kidney uh, related complications, um, a question mark of cardiovascular disease with, with chronic oral NSAIDs. So I would rather treat the, the episodes, which are intermittent, acute, tend to respond to the topical steroids or a very short course of prednisone um, rather than having patients on long-term oral NSAIDs. Okay. If a patient is on immunosuppression like methotrexate or Humira for their joint disease like ankylosing spondylitis, this will reduce the number of uveitis flares that they experience. I think a common misconception is that we use immunomodulatory therapy to treat the uveitis in B27 patients, and that's rarely the case. The typical course of iritis in this disease is an acute symptomatic episode with long periods of, of quiescence and then a recurrence. And so we just treat each individual episode. Clinical pearls, don't forget infectious causes of a hypopian. 
there is such a thing as too much or too little steroids. I tend to start strong and then slow, taper slowly. Dilate every patient with uveitis. Okay, this is case four. We have a 35 year old man. He presents for a routine exam, no ocular complaints, no past medical history or ocular history. Um, vision in the left eye is slightly worse at 20-25 and he has um, slightly increased pressure in the left eye, 24. This is a photo of an anterior segment. In the bottom right hand quarter, we can notice heterochromia, so he has different eye color. And then we can see keratic precipitates in the cornea and they look small, white, um, and they're diffusely located, so from the top down to the bottom of the cornea. So I would call those stellate KP. He has one plus anterior chamber cell, and you notice the iris atrophy uh, with a little bit of a moth-eaten appearance. He has a mild cataract in that left eye as well, and some trace anterior vitreous cell inflammation. You think to do gonioscopy, the right eye is normal, but you notice some fine blood vessels traversing the trabecular meshwork in that left angle. So differential diagnosis. Top of the list would be Fuchs heterochromic erythroclitis. Always consider herpetic disease with the asymmetric pressures. Um, Posner-Schlossman syndrome, if that exists. Um, and then other causes of heterochromia, just to keep in mind, congenital horners, melanosis, um, melanoma, and then extensive rubiosis can also give the appearance of having different iris colors. So this is pretty classic presentation of Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis, abbreviated FHI. And you can see the common findings here. Uh, this does not have the classic findings of anterior uveitis, so no pain, redness, light sensitivity. Um, it's classically no, to have the small diffuse um, keratic precipitates and diffuse meaning floor to ceiling rather than just being located in the inferior third of the cornea or alt triangle. Low grade anterior chamber inflammation. So if you're seeing three plus AC cell, this is not Fuchs. Um, the iris stromal atrophy, which is what causes the difference in the eye color. They don't have the classic findings of anterior uveitis um, the structural complications like macular edema or posterior snakei. And then they can have the fine blood vessels on the surface of the angle. These can spontaneously bleed causing a hyphema or that can happen during gonioscopy or during surgery. That's known as Amsler sign. And then sometimes we forget that there can also be a little bit of anterior vitreous inflammation with Fuchs um, as well as the unilateral cataract. These patients often present with chronic open angle glaucoma that they didn't know they have. So treatment in this is a little bit different. Um, this may be the only case of anterior chamber inflammation that we don't need to treat until there's zero cells in the anterior chamber. Um, so the low grade inflammation is not very responsive to topical steroids. Um, and it's okay to leave the mild low grade inflammation there since it's not associated with the structural complications um, of anterior uveitis that we see in other disease. Sometimes patients have bouts of increased inflammation that can be symptomatic with pain or floaters. Um, and then we would use a very short course of topical steroids just to treat that increase in inflammation if it was symptomatic. The most important part of Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclotic iridocyclitis is to treat the intraocular pressure. So these patients commonly developed glaucoma, so really treating the IOP is, is important. Um, we can get a little bit caught up in trying to treat that AC cell, and now we're putting steroids on the eye, and it can be difficult to tell if it's a steroid response versus high pressure from that open angle glaucoma. Clinical pearls, you see someone with unilateral uveitis and high intraocular pressure, I would still think about herpetic disease. Um, and don't overtreat with steroids, for the reasons that we mentioned. Our next case is a six-year-old girl. She comes in your office because she failed vision screening at school, and then the parents took her to an optometrist um, at Walmart, and they couldn't refract her to better than 2040 and 2060. So now she ends up in your office. Past medical history um, is unremarkable, but mom does mention that she has a little bit of knee swelling um, and ankle swelling at times. She has poor dilation and irregular pupils, but a normal pressure in both eyes. And then a slit lamp exam is notable for uh, non-granulomatous K2 
KPs in both eyes, anterior chamber inflammation. She has posterior synechii bilateral and some posterior subcapsular cataracts forming. Look in the back of the eye and notice that the optic nerves are mildly hyperemic, slightly elevated, but otherwise the fundus looks normal. Doing a MAC OCT, we can see macular edema. So differential for this, high, high on the list would be JIA associated uveitis. It's a child that presents with chronic anterior uveitis and has some knee swelling and ankle swelling. Other things on the differential would be idiopathic uveitis that can look much like JIA-associated uveitis, but there's no systemic disease. And then TINU, which stands for tubulo-interstitial nephritis and uveitis, is a rare syndrome that involves inflammation of the kidneys as well as uveitis. So workup for this is a little bit different than the workup in adults. I would add a beta-2 microglobulin in the urine. That would rule out TINU if it's normal. I check a rheumatoid factor and ANA in children um, with anterior uveitis, but not adults, because that can help you um, categorize the type of, of JAA if they end up having it. And then ruling out things such as sarcoid, syphilis, and TB. And we talked about the ANA not being included in the workup of adults with anterior uveitis, um, since just anterior uveitis is not associated with the lupus. So this is a case of JIA-associated uveitis. The patient was ANA positive. Um, classic findings of this is the absence of pain, redness, and photophobia. So these kids present with chronic inflammation. They already have structural complications, such as posterior synechii and cataracts, um, because they don't know, they're, they, they're not having the pain and redness, um, and, and young kids aren't able to say that, hey, I have blurry vision in one eye. And then, um, it tends to be non-granulominous, bilateral, anterior uveitis, but they can have some intermediate uveitis as well. Treatment for this. First off, are you confident with the exam that you got in the office? Um, does the visual acuity fit what you're seeing? If not, then consider an exam under anesthesia. I would start with topical steroids and cycloplegia even before the workup, the laboratory workup comes back. And then I would refer these patients to pediatric rheumatology for an evaluation of their joints, and they can also help manage immunosuppression. And we know that early initiation of immunomodulatory therapy in these patients um, can be helpful and have better predictors of long-term visual outcomes. In this patient that already presents with structural complications um, with cataracts, posterior synechii, especially if you see band keratopathy, um, I would start immunomodulatory therapy um, essentially immediately along with their topical steroids. So where to go from here? If you're seeing this patient um, at a community clinic and you're not comfortable managing immunosuppression, um, send them to a, a uveitis provider or someone that is comfortable managing immunosuppression that works closely with pediatric rheumatology. Um, and the reason for this is that studies show that early referral to a subspecialist in this patient population is improved with visual outcomes. So if you start them on topical steroids, the inflammation will get better. And then you taper them and the inflammation will come back. So you feel like you're, you're treating it and it's getting better. And then it can be tempting to just leave them on four times a day prednisolone acetate, but we know the risks of that with cataracts and glaucoma. So um, systemic immunomodulatory therapy have better outcomes. These patients need to be followed regularly, even if they don't have any history of uveitis or any symptoms. And there's charts for the guidelines of how frequently they need to be monitored based on age, ANA status, um, duration of disease, but sometimes it's as frequently as every three months. Um, refer early and dilate every patient with uveitis. This is our last case. Uh, a 30 year old woman that notes some floaters in both eyes over the last few months. Uh, no pain or redness, no light sensitivity. She has a past medical history of hypothyroidism. Social history is non-contributory. And vision is slightly decreased, more so in the right eye. Anterior segment is unremarkable. When we look in the posterior segment, we notice um, two plus vitreous cell with mild haze and one plus vitreous cell in the left eye.
there's some nerve hyperemia and you notice some sheathing of the vessels and you look at the peripheral retina with scleral depression and you can see some exudates on the pars plana known as a snowbank. A macular OCT shows a mild epiretinal membrane, um, some haze presumably from the vitreous cell and very mild macular edema. So we have vitreous inflammation, optic nerve involvement, and, and macular edema. It's tempted to call this panuveitis. This often gets referred in as panuveitis, but this is really just intermediate uveitis with secondary posterior findings such as, um, as, it, as optic nerve edema and macular edema. This is not posterior uveitis since there's no inflammation in the retina or choroid itself. So this is just intermediate uveitis. Causes of intermediate uveitis, number one is idiopathic. It's not associated with any other systemic disease or infection. Um, next is sarcoid and then multiple sclerosis and then less likely is infectious etiologies. Could this be panuveitis or posterior uveitis and it's just a hazy view and we can't see the retina or choroid well enough to see if there's inflammatory nodules or lesions, that's possible. So I think it would warrant doing fluorescein angiography or an ICG to look for a posterior involvement. This is a wide field angiography of the right eye. We can see there's optic nerve leakage. And then in the periphery, we can see this fern-like retinovascular leakage, which is very classic for intermediate uveitis. Workup, I would do a good review of systems ask carefully about neurologic symptoms since we're worried about MS, ask about infectious exposures and things like cough, shortness of breath for sarcoid. For laboratory imaging, I would get the typical labs ruling out sarcoid, syphilis, TB, uh, a chest X-ray, consider other infectious etiologies um, depending on their exposures. And then it says neuroimaging only if warranted. So we know multiple sclerosis is on the list of possible causes. A lot of times I'm asked, do you get an MRI of the brain for every patient that presents with intermediate uveitis? And the answer is no. I only do neuroimaging if they have um, symptoms such as intermittent numbness, weakness in an extremity, um, or if I'm starting anti-TNF therapy in a patient with intermediate uveitis, we know these medications can worsen demyelinating disease. So um, if we think they have just idiopathic intermediate uveitis, but we're starting Humira, I would do an MRI of the brain. So pars planitis is the term used for idiopathic intermediate uveitis with exudates on the pars plana. These are the classic findings, which we've reviewed. Here's some interesting facts about intermediate uveitis. So smoking is a risk factor for increasing macular edema in patients with intermediate uveitis. So that's just another reason to tell your patients to quit smoking. Um, up to 10% of patients with MS develop uveitis, most commonly intermediate uveitis. And having uveitis um, it makes someone 18 times more likely over their lifetime to develop MS relative to the general population. I think this is just the fact that autoimmune diseases do run together. Management for intermediate uveitis. You can do periocular steroid injections, intraocular steroid injections, um, oral prednisone I use often if the patient presents with bilateral active disease. Um, there's evidence for laser photocoagulation or cryothera cryotherapy to the pars plana. Um, immunomodulatory therapy in chronic or recurrent disease, and then um, considering a vitrectomy, which can be um, diagnostic if you're worried about um, infectious causes, and um, there's some evidence that vitrectomy can be therapeutic as well. So my clinical pearl for intermediate uveitis not every single vitreous cell needs to be treated. Um, with anterior chamber inflammation, we like to see the cells go to zero. However, with intermediate uveitis, um, often patients can have a few vitreous cells. Um, if they're not bothered by their floaters, if the vision's good, there's no macular edema, um, the FA doesn't show leakage in, in the major arcades, um, and there's no findings on FA such as neovascularization or non-perfusion. Um, we can just observe. So maybe someone comes in with trace vitreous cell, minimal haze, good vision, 
Um, you do a workup and it's negative, you could observe that patient without treatment. Absolutely dilate every patient with uveitis. All right, that's the end of this lecture. I do have another lecture coming called um, Posterior Uveitis, Diagnosis Not to Miss. So I would encourage you to uh, watch that one as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.